Hi y'all, in this video I'll be responding to Noel Plum's uh, video asking some questions to Americans on the Second Amendment. Uh, so here are the questions. Uh, the first one is, why is, uh, quote, you can't take away our guns as we have a constitutional slash Second Amendment right to them, end quote, a reasonable response to calls to ban such guns? Uh, the same reason that it would be a reasonable response to uh, someone who is asking that we pass a law, uh, you know, that I don't know, South Carolina passes a law that bans black people from voting. Uh, it would be a perfectly reasonable response to that to say you can't do it because the Constitution prohibits it. And that's uh, because the people who are arguing for the gun laws that, you, that you're talking about or the uh, voting laws I'm talking about aren't arguing that we amend the Constitution. They're arguing that we get a legislature to do it. One of the difficulties in trying to explain to, sadly, far too many Americans, but uh, beyond that, uh, uh, people from the West who are foreign to the United States is how the United States works. They just don't get it. They don't understand the basic assumptions that go into the American system. And you, Noel Plum, you betrayed some of this uh, misunderstanding of the American way of doing things in your video. Now, curiously enough, there are people who are good at uh, foreign-born, who are good at understanding uh, the American system. We have many of them here who have become citizens, like Judge Kaczynski in the Ninth Circuit. He's a federal appellate judge, used to be the chief judge of the Ninth Circuit. That's the court just below our Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, his parents survived Hitler's Holocaust to move to uh, Gheorghe Dej's Romania, or however you pronounce his fucking name, uh, and they escaped that and made it to the United States, and he rose to be a federal judge here in the United States. And there's a case I'm going to read from a little bit from later on where he has some very insightful words. Uh, it takes people who, who grew up under the, the boot heel of, of the Gestapo, uh, under Stalin's communism, Mao's communism, that Soviet bloc, that communist bloc, uh, to really get the distinction between the American system and other Western systems. And uh, there are three uh, major parts to the United States uh, in terms of citizens and, and politics. You have the federal government, you have the state governments, and you have the people. So those are the three uh, large groups of entities. At the federal level, you have three branches of government. Uh, you have the executive, the president, the legislature, the Congress, uh, Senate, and the House of Rep Representatives. And then you have the judiciary, the Supreme Court and such inferior courts that the Congress from time to time will uh, authorize. Now, uh, one of the... Well, I'll, I'll address this in just a second, but just remember, three parts to the government. And there is uh, a certain set of hierarchies that attend different types of laws that can come out of any of these uh, groups. For, for example, some states have direct democracies. Uh, you know, they have initiative processes. Um, they have referendums they can do. So they, uh, they can put something to the, the people of that state, and the, state uh, the people in the state can vote on it directly. And they also have a representative form of government that they have uh, legislatures whom they, uh, they elect from time to time to take care of the day-to-day -day stuff. And sometimes the legislature will refer to uh, the citizens of that state something for a referendum. Sometimes the citizens don't like what the government's doing, and they will directly act to overrule uh, their state government. Uh, and then at the federal level, you have uh, federal laws that are written pursuant to the United States Constitution. And the United States Constitution, the federal government, has no direct say in what it is allowed to do, what goes into that document. They can ask for, they can ask for something. Uh, they can beg the states, they can beg the people, please give us this power, uh, please amend the Constitution to do this, but the most that they can do uh, is two-thirds of the House and two-thirds of the Senate can agree on some language and then say, hey states, we would like for you to consider this, and then it goes to the states, uh, either in their legislatures or special uh, ratifying conventions they might, uh, they might uh, adopt from time to time to do this, and they evaluate uh, the request from the Congress, and then they say yay or nay. And in order to say yay, you have to have 75% of the states, three-quarters of the states, 38 states, to agree that the Constitution will be changed. It is very difficult to do this. Um, the process is not generally a short one, though sometimes it is. The, uh, for example, women's suffrage took less than a year, whereas men's suffrage, complete male suffrage, uh, took 50 years after that uh, for men who were eligible to be drafted and were in fact drafted into wars to finally be able to vote uh, on the government that will be consigning them to their death to their being maimed, to their being forced to kill or be killed. We had millions of American male men who could not vote, who were sent off to war, many thousands of them died, never having had a say in the government that was condemning them to their fates. 
women got it pretty much the moment they asked for it. Men had to beg uh, until finally the American people said, we're, we're tired of the... There was always a promise after every war. We won't draft people under 21. That was the voting age. We won't draft people under 21. Uh, that line sounds really, really great. The problem with it is that line was a, was a matter of legislative grace. It came from the Congress, which it could do away with at will. And every time it got inconvenient, they did away with it at will. World War I, no, uh, no, no drafting of people who can't vote. Ah, uh, shit, we're getting a lot of people killed, we need some more people. Let's repeal that law, uh, draft those 18-year-olds, draft those 19-year-olds, draft those 20-year-olds, fuck them if they can't vote. They need to go die in the trenches for us because now it's inconvenient. After the war's over, oh, well, you know, it, it was extraordinary. We won't do that again. World War II came around. They repeated it. This went on for better than a century. And then finally, they said, no, we're amending the Constitution. Congress, you can't be trusted uh, to stick with your word. You are liars. We are stripping you of this power. Bam. It will no longer be possible for anyone to be drafted in this country who has not had uh, a say in electing the government that will be deciding whether or not he'll be drafted. We're tired of that shit. And then you have our most recent amendment, which was originally proposed to be one of the, uh, the first amendments. Uh, it came along with the Bill of Rights. It was one of, I think, 12 proposals. That was debated on for better than 200 years. It wasn't until the 1990s that finally uh, the, the, uh, three, the 38th state, the, the, what you needed now, to hit three quarters, uh, got together and decided, yeah, we're going to prohibit Congress from deciding that it can vote itself a pay raise that takes effect within the same term that they're elected. Uh, we don't like that. You keep giving yourselves raises and giving yourselves raises and giving yourselves raises. Knock it off. After 200 years, we're not going to stand for that anymore, motherfuckers. So, um, your second question is, would your position change if a magic wand could be waived that removed all guns, including off the never do wells, uh, all in one go? And then in your video, you said, uh, you know, so the criminals wouldn't have it, you know, the bad guys, uh, we good folks would be disarmed. But the police would still have it. And you don't seem to appreciate that the European view of government is not remotely like the American view of government. We don't trust our governments. And this is built into every public institution that we have. It is why we have jury trials. We have an absolute right, without question, in all criminal proceedings to demand a jury trial. The government has no option but to give us a jury trial if we demand it. You don't have that in the UK. You do have jury trials in the UK, but they can be abrogated by a judge uh, under certain conditions. In the United States, it's not permissible ever to take that away from a criminal defendant. The decision of, of what the person whose liberty is at stake, uh, what will constitute a just panel to decide his guilt, is entirely his choice. If he wants 12 citizens to do it, or six or whatever it is, he gets those citizens. If he wants to let a judge do it, he gets the judge. So uh, that's the democratic constraint. That is the lack of trust in our judges, the people who we who go into office, uh, we think being learned in the law, the most reasonable, the most responsible of public officials, the most reflective, the best educated of necessity. We don't trust them. Judges can't be trusted with power. Who can? No one can. This is, this is what undergirds the American system at every level. No one is so good as to be trusted with too much power to include, and this is, this is the paradox of America, and this is why Tocqueville talked about American exceptionalism, he's the first one to bring it up, that it's a system that could not work in any other land in the world. It is the paradox. No one can be trusted with power, not even the people. That's why you have uh, certain amendments in the Bill of Rights. It is as much a constraint on the power of the legislature as it is on the power of the majority. The American people, after having fought a long war and listening to all the arguments, decided that there are certain issues that no people can be entrusted to make the, the right decision for other people. Religion, what political opinions to have, what party to vote for, voting parties at the time, uh, how to protect themselves in their own homes, how to see about the issues that are important in their lives. That's the First Amendment. That's the Second Amendment. The sanctity of the home. That's the Third and the Fourth. Um, whether or not he can be conscripted in, to being an instrument of his own demise in a trial. These cannot be trusted even to the majority. So the majority enacted into law 
uh, amendments to the Constitution that took away power from itself so that way it couldn't become the agent of oppression. And we have a long history in the United States of seeing oppression. I uh, don't need to remind people uh, we had a civil war. So back to what I was talking about earlier on the response about uh, why would it be a good response to say to someone who wants to take away, who wants to pass a law in South Carolina to prohibit black people from voting to say the Constitution says otherwise. It's because they're not arguing to change the Constitution. They're arguing to do something that the American people have already decided is not within any government's power and even shouldn't be trusted to the people themselves unless you can get the largest supermajority known in any government anywhere to agree. Uh, it's possible to defeat a constitutional amendment with uh, less than, uh, I think, it, I haven't run the numbers lately, but less than about 9 or 10 percent of the popular vote in the United States. It is exceedingly difficult. So on the voting issue with blacks, the last time we had that debate over whether they should be given the right or not given the right, whether they should be free or not be free, we had to sacrifice nearly a million lives to argue that point. We don't want to argue that, argue that again. So several amendments came in the wake of the Civil War that stripped that decision from, from the democratic stage. That's what constitutional amendments do. It's not a living constitution. You write a constitution not to facilitate, not to facilitate change, but to rigidify and prevent change. It's to stop governments from acting. It's to stop the people themselves, unless it is the most overwhelming consensus of opinion known to man in order to be able to change that. And those things that we write in there aren't the most important things that could be written in an, in, in a legal instrument, by the way. But they're the things that, um, that we have shown time and again. There is no death count too large that we won't pay it to insist upon these words on that page. And anyone who wants to amend it, uh, who wants to take it away, can do it by uh, only one way, persuasion. It is either you persuade us or we find out who is surviving after the, after the uh, smoke has cleared from the battlefield. Those are the options. But the cowards on the gun control side don't want to go the constitutional route because they recognize it's difficult. Most of the country doesn't agree with us. What we need to do is do it by the back door, and that's why you're seeing a lot of resistance from people like me. Um, so the federal government can't be trusted with power. The police can't be trusted with power. The Congress can't be trusted with power. The president can't be trusted with power. The judiciary can't be trusted with the power. The states can't be trusted with power. The people can't be trusted with power. Everyone needs to be suspicious of every other major institution because somewhere in one of those, there is a tyrant lurking at some time. And all he needs to seize power is convenience, and some, some convenient uh, problem arising in the world. For example, um, whenever there is a terrorist attack, you have people like Marco Rubio who say, well, what we need to do is not focus on terrorists and where they are and what they're doing. We need to focus on the other 320 million people in the country. We need to listen to what 320 million of you who aren't the terrorists are doing in your private lives who you're talking to, where you're going, what your friends are, what your friends are, where the political persuasions are, uh, all these kinds of things. We need to go there. No, 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 we're not having that shit. And if the government wants to push it, it will just have to be war. So in order to facilitate um, having uh, distrust of other groups and, and to be able to check them, uh, you have to also be able to balance them. And that's why each institution has its own set of powers and they all have an independent ability to act, to include the citizens. We don't require the government's permission to take up arms and to depose a tyrant. It's not, it's not their proper call. There's a distinction between a rebellion, which is an unjust opposition to just power, and a revolution, or a justified rebellion, a just resistance to unjust power, which is, that was the teeth in which this country was forged. Anyway, so, um, you have the federal military. Each state has its own military, which when you look at it in the aggregate, the military controlled by the states is uh, at least as powerful as the military directly controlled by the federal government. This is not accidental. This is because we don't trust standing armies all that much. So if you're going to have a standing army, we need a reserve army that is equipped with all the same weapons to include nukes. To, I mean, that part of that is in, in the National Guard's uh, control to be able 
to stop them, or at least to prevent, uh, to cause some kind of deterrence to make them think twice. And barring that, you have the private citizens who, as Yamamoto has falsely claimed as having said, have a gun, have a rifle behind every blade of grass in the United States. A lot of people seem to think that this doesn't pose any problem for militaries. The only people who think that are people who don't do military planning. Uh, 50 million armed citizens do scare tyrants. 50 million armed citizens do scare military planners. And more importantly, they scare soldiers. Uh, anyway, I, there was, there's been exactly one American in, in the history of this country who was trusted to have a great deal of power without much question. That was only George Washington. They, they were going to make him king of the United States. And George Washington showed uh, his greatness as to why he is the type of person who could have been trusted with some kind of power like that. Because after having led an army that conquered all the land, George Washington surrendered his army to the people. He surrendered his command to the people. He is the only person in the history of the world, of whom I'm aware, who could have made himself absolute dictator and uh, categorically relinquished all of that power and ran away from it. You have to look at uh, the American Revolution. The people who led the American Revolution weren't people who were down and out. George Washington was one of the richest men, one of the richest men in all the world. He had everything privilege could buy. He had everything heart could desire in his time. And yet he sacrificed it all for a higher notion, the notion of liberty. And it sounds corny, but it is difficult, it is difficult for people who have lived comfortable lives to understand what that means. Anyway, um, Judge Kaczynski's uh, parents lived in the Holocaust. They survived it. And out of Hitler's National Socialism, they went into communism, and they fled from that to here. And he rose to one of the most powerful positions in this country. It's one of the great things about this country. Anyway, and this is a case called uh, uh, Silviero v. Lockyer, Lockley or Lockyer, or something like that. And it's a gun case. <clears throat> and Kaczynski is excoriating his colleagues. Uh, judges know very well how to read the Constitution broadly when they are being sympathetic to the right being asserted. We have held, without much ado, that, quote, speech or the press, end quote, also means the Internet. See Reno against ACLU. And that, quote, persons, houses, papers, and effects, end quote, also means public telephone booths. See Katz versus United States. When a particular right comports especially well with our notions of good social policy, we build magnificent legal edifices on elliptical constitutional phrases, or even the white spaces between the lines of the constitution, constitutional text. But as the panel amply demonstrates, when we're none too keen on a particular constitutional guarantee, we can be equally ingenious in burying language that is incontrovertibly there. Vernaculus mentioned this to you. A lot of people on the left, a lot of judges and lawyers on the left, want to read out of the Constitution the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. They say it, it doesn't have anything to do with the right that belongs to the people. Apparently it's one of those, uh, those unicorn rights in the Constitution that was just granted to no one in particular. It, it's there, but no one possesses it. No person can, can claim it. It belongs to no one. It is just a right that is randomly written in the Constitution for, you know, shits and giggles. I'll come back to this granting in a moment. It is wrong to use some constitutional provisions as springboards for major social change while treating others like senile relatives to be cooped up in a nursing home until they quit annoying us. The majority falls prey to the delusion, popular in some circles, that ordinary people are too careless and stupid to own guns, and we should be far better off leaving all the weapons in the hands of professionals on the government payroll. But the simple truth, born out of experience, painfully in my country and around the world, is that tyranny thrives best where government need not fear the wrath of an armed people. Our own sorry history bears this out. Disarmament was the tool of choice for subjugating both slaves and free blacks in the South. In Florida, patrols searched blacks' homes for weapons, confiscated those found, and punished their owners without judicial process. They were lynched, if they were lucky. In the North, by contrast, blacks ex exercised their right to bear arms to defend against racial mob violence. Justice Taney well appreciated the institution of slavery required a class of people who lacked the means to resist. 
Every tyrant understands this. The only people who don't understand this are comfortable liberals. Uh, see Dred Scott versus Sanford, one of the worst decisions ever written in the history of law in, in the Western tradition. Finding black citizenship unthinkab unthinkable <clears throat> because it would give blacks the right to keep and carry arms wherever they went. A revolt by Nat Turner and a few dozen other armed blacks could be put down without much difficulty. One by four million armed blacks would have meant big trouble. All too many of the other great tragedies of history, Stalin's atrocities, the killing fields of Cambodia, the Holocaust, which his family survived, to name but a few, were perpetrated by armed troops against unarmed populations. Many could have well avoided or been mitigated had the perpetrators known their intended victims were equipped with a rifle and 20 bullets apiece, as the Militia Act here required. See Kleinfeld dissent. Uh, anyway, um, if a few hundred Jewish fighters in the Warsaw Ghetto could hold off the Wehrmacht for almost a month, longer than all of France was able to hold off the, Wehr the Wehrmacht, by the way, for almost a month with only a handful of weapons, six million Jews armed with rifles could not so easily have been herded into the cattle cars. My excellent colleagues have forgotten these bitter lessons of history. The prospect of tyranny may not grab the headlines the way vivid stories of gun crime routinely do, but few saw the Third Reich coming until it was too late. The Second Amendment is a doomsday provision, one designed for those exceptionally rare circumstances where all other rights have failed, where the government refuses to stand for re-election and silences those who protest, where courts have lost the courage to oppose or can find no one to enforce their decrees, which has happened in the United States, the Supreme Court has written their mandate, let us see them enforce it. Andrew Jackson. However improbable these contingencies may seem today, facing them unprepared is a mistake a free people get to make only once. In other words, when it comes to removing rights, when snatching liberty out of people's hands, there are certain mistakes that history does not forgive if you make. You make them once, and it can, it, it can easily spell the ruination of everything else. And it is difficult to say that the one thing that enabled my country to exist is the one thing that we should be eager to get rid of by not even trying to use the Constitution. For those who don't know the history, um, what was it? What was the spark that started our revolution? What was it that was the shot heard round the world? It was when, no plum, uh, General Thomas Gage, from your country, marched to Lexington and Concord to do what? To take away the firearms of the colonists. To take away their capacity to resist. Uh, there was a lot going on, much tension and blah blah blah, but this was the event that the only response from the American people was instant death. There was no other possible outcome other than war. Um, and even for a little while after there, they were trying to talk to the king, they wanted to remain subjects of England, uh, but they wanted to be independent on their taxes, which is what they'd been for a long time. But once they came to get the guns, they said, it's revolution. Bring it, bitches. Now, Vernaculus brings up um, something that I talk about a lot. It's called the Battle of Athens. This isn't ancient history. This is the idea behind the Second Amendment. That tyrants, one of the ideas behind it, tyrants are easier to stop if you kill them sooner rather than later. Hitler doesn't become Hitler. They, they didn't know about Hitler. Hitler doesn't become Hitler at the height of his power overnight. It takes years and you have to start somewhere. There has to be the first murder victim. There has to be the first... Uh, the, the first chain of liberty has to be broken somewhere. Someone has to be that first victim. And that's where you start paying attention. And then when you start seeing more and more of this, that's when your options to handle it through other means are contrasted and con contracted and contracted and contracted until you resort to bloodshed. The Declaration of Independence. When they have suffered a long train of abuses and usurpations of, de of despotism to their liberties, it is their right, no, their duty to rise up and throw off their tyrant. The Battle of Athens. This is about a hundred years after the Civil War, a little less. And there was a little town in Kentucky or Tennessee where uh, the government literally stole the election. I mean literally. With force, they went and stole the ballots. Now, this community had petitioned the Congress, petitioned the federal government. Government, we, we have 
a tyrant. Please, come help us. The Constitution says you will guarantee to us a Republican form of government. It's an obligation of yours to intervene. Please, come help us get our elections back. Please, please, please help us. We did an investigation, said we're not worried about it. They begged the state, state, please, please come help us. The state said, go fuck yourselves. After about a decade or 15 years or something like that of this, a black man wanted to go vote. A free citizen tried to vote, and the government shot him in the United States. In the, in the United States, and the people who want to argue um, with this new system should say, that nigger should have fucking died. He didn't have a right to vote. But no, that's not what the citizens in this town did. They immediately revolted. They uh, charged the, uh, the National Guard Armory, took its weapons, and they laid siege to the town. The National Guard was called out. The governor and the National Guard arrive, and they see this hours-long gun battle going on between these citizens. White men in the South fighting for a black man's right to vote. The governor said, stay out of it. Let them handle it. So they had this hours-long gun battle, which was finally resolved when these brave men, who had fought in World War II, uh, went to the jail where the sheriff and the deputies uh, had taken the ballots to count them in secret to announce themselves as the victors yet again. And they used explosives to remove the front part of the building and went in and liberated the ballots, counted them and restore their own government. The people on the left who argue about restricting people's rights because some crime happens here or there are saying that it, it's more important um, that these niggers in the South not be able to, to enforce their right to vote than it is that we have better policing practices or do this, that, and the other, or that we violate the Constitution and take away people's rights. They don't understand um, the, the importance of a people being able to rise up and slaughter their government when the government puts a gun to the back of the first victim and shoots him for the crime of voting. You cannot stop tyrants with a ballot box. Tyrants respect only one thing, and that is power. They, ex they respect only power. Only, only power, ever power. That is all. Now, the argument that, well, you know, the citizens might lose against a government here or there, maybe. That's an argument for better arming the, the people or restricting the arms to the government. It isn't, a, it isn't an argument that, well, because you may or may not win, you should surrender every capacity you have to even stand a chance. I mean, you know, if it's not a 100% guaranteed victory, then you should, you should go out of your way to make sure it's a 100% guaranteed loss. I mean, in the United States, there are people who own their own fully functional private artillery pieces that can take out any tank in the United States uh, surplus, any tank in the world. I sleep fine. Anyway, so when you say that the police will have it, you are talking from the position of a subject, not that of a citizen of a republic, a subject of a monarch, a, a duly owned property of a sovereign. Here, the government is owned by the people, and we retain the ability to kill all of its members if we need to, to enforce that, to make sure they get it through their thick heads, that we own them, they don't own us, rather than the historical practice through all of Europe is that I own you and you people live in my largesse. You have uh, parliamentary su uh, supremacy in the United Kingdom. The parliament is supreme on all matters. You don't have rights in, in a constitutional sense in, in the United Kingdom. You have privileges that are given to you as a matter of grace by the largesse of your government, which they can and have in the past many times taken away whenever they want. Magna Carta, we have this myth about the beauty of Magna Carta. Magna Carta was issued and then rescinded immediately, and then reissued, and then you had the, the, treaty, uh, the, the Charter of the Forest, and the reissue of Magna Carta, the, the rescension of Magna Carta, the reissue, I mean, Magna Carta, there are like 20 or 30 different versions. Uh, kings would take it away and then give it back, take it away and give it back when it was convenient. We don't repeat your mistakes in Europe. You guys fought the same fucking wars for thousands of years over and over and over. We don't have to fight the same wars over and over and over and over. 
because unlike you, we learn from history. There is one thing that you do after you win. Uh, one, you win, and two, you make the, the victory absolute. You don't accept anything other than the absolute subjugation of whoever you're fighting. And then after you have completely got them on their knees to where they're begging for their lives, literally, then you grant mercy on the condition, if you ever try it again, we kill all of you. Those are the options that you have when the United States goes to war instead of these little photo op um, interventions we do here and there, the stupid shit we're involved with. When we actually are riled and go to war, our enemies have two options, because they're the only two options we will go with uh, if, it, if it turns against us. It will be absolute, total annihilation of you and all of your people and all of your lands, or it will be your absolute subjection. And the one course this country never has, has chosen is subjection. If you want to win here to subject the American people, you will have to kill us all. You will have to raise the whole fucking continent to a pile of ash. We won't have it any other way. It, it, it is about establishing a rule of law and having continuity, and in order to make sure that these things that we have fought and sacrificed so much for remain germane and remain manifest, it is vital that the people be able to rise up and kill their own fucking governments from time to time. As Thomas Jefferson said, a little rebellion every now and again is healthy. In my own state, not three years ago, uh, Vernaculus also mentioned this, there was a law that was passed banning firearms in public spaces. Now this is, this is a, a, a law that is unlawful. Um, as I mentioned, we have a hierarchy of laws. The Constitution, and then uh, you have legislatures who can do ordinary legislation. Only the people in all the states can amend a constitution. All the people in the state or all the states for the federal constitution. Uh, so everything else is subject to the, that express will of the American people. Anyway, on paper. Uh, obviously, people write the law. But anyway, um, in my state, there is a categorical prohibition to all political subdivisions of the state to enact gun laws. Uh, the, the way it reads is that uh, the state of Washington and its sovereign power occupies the field and deprives all of the cities in all of, all of the land of the power to enact gun laws uh, beyond incorporating directly the state law into the municipal code. So, for example, in Seattle, uh, you know, if there's like a Washington statute number one that says, uh, you, you know, no killing people with a gun, uh, Seattle can't say no killing people with a gun plus Fridays. What they can do is they can incorporate it uh, wholly into the Seattle, Seattle Municipal Code and say it, we'll call the Seattle, Seattle Municipal Code 3, and it incorporates State Code 1. That's, that's about the, the limit of their, their power. So in other words, they can transcribe it. But this government, this, this town council decided, fuck it. Fuck the state law, fuck the constitution, the state constitution, fuck the federal constitution, uh, fuck the militia, fuck you people, fuck you, fuck you all, we're taking your rights, you don't have a right to, to have guns in our, in our city, you can't carry them in public, concealed, unconcealed, we don't want any of that, we want our own little nice totalitarian uh, exemption from all the laws and all the land. The city attorney said, this is unlawful, um, if you do it, you will lose in court, this isn't open to interpretation, there's no wiggle room, there's no, there's no option, this is not discretionary. This is a ministerial duty. You have only one option, and that is to enforce it strictly. A citizen shows up, concerned that he's been deprived of his rights. He has a concealed weapon. He mentions that he carries everywhere he goes concealed. He's a returning war veteran, wounded in, uh, wounded in combat. And a city council member, this fucking pussy coward, stands up and asks, wants the mayor to ask the guy if he's armed now. And so, in the long short of, they ask the guy if he's armed now. He says, yes, I'm armed right this second. And... And the guy wanted the, the police to come and kick the, the kid out. And uh, the mayor said, I'm not calling the police. And I can just tell you, uh, the police wouldn't have come to take the guy out We're around here. They'd be like, sorry, city council, fuck you. But putting that off to the side. So this councilman says, well, I need to be excused, please, Mr. Mayor, with your little mayor's like, yeah, get out. So the guy gathers up his, his papers and runs out because there's an armed citizen coming to confront him. Well, that didn't go over so well. The following uh, session, that guy did not come alone, and he didn't come carrying a concealed weapon. He and many other citizens in this fair little town uh, walked in, guns in hand, across the shoulder, on the hip, hands on it, whatever, and gave this city council 
a piece of their mind. They said, you know, we're going to sue you in the courts and you're going to lose. It's going to cost us a lot of money. But, you know, if we don't lose, we want you to know, we'll come back and kill you. They didn't say it quite like that, but you, you got the long and the short of it. If we lose in court, it doesn't matter. We own this. These are our rights. Uh, if we have to choose between our rights and your deaths, you have to die. Uh, the one guy is a child of a family, not all of whom survived the Holocaust. And he had his rifle on his shoulder and goes, I will not go quietly into the night. You will not find me on any cattle cars, ever. And that is the distinction between free citizens, like in the United States, and subjects of a sovereign, which is the attitude you have in the whole of Europe, in the western part of it at least, even though you're technically citizens now. Even Christopher Hitchens was not able to make this distinction, the distinction between uh, privileges and rights. He has the European mindset of uh, the lowly, the hoi polloi, the unwashed masses, beg the largesse of the government, they pray the government for relief, which the government will grant them, and then they can enjoy that. And then uh, he mentioned this in a speech about uh, health care, or not, he was talking about health care, you mentioned this too. About and there's something about the American spirit. They look Americans. They look down on people in the rest of the world who want the government to come by and do things for them. Because you know, you know, you go out to the West. Uh, all politics are yokels. He said. Uh, he says it's kind of pathetic that um, Tea Partiers will show up and I'll have a sign that says, "I'm here today to exercise my First Amendment." And on the back it says, "But next time I might be exercising my second. He goes, "It's really pathetic." He doesn't understand it either. Des despite how well educated he is, he can't get out of the mindset of being a slave to a sovereign even when he comes to a free country. So he says the, the mindset of these people is what they want, what they ask their government for is just, you know, please, please let me have my gun and please let me have my church. No, 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 never, not once, no, not going to happen. We don't ask our government for these things. We tell our government, we will have this or it is war. We will have freedom of religion, we will have freedom of speech, our citizens will be armed, Armed. You, you will not deposit soldiers in our citizens' homes, you will not rifle through our possessions, our homes, our persons, our papers, our effects, you will not force people to testify against themselves, you will not deny people the right to a jury, you will not deny them the right to bring counsel, you will not deny them the right to have their say in court in a public hearing, you will not do this, you will not do that, you will not do the other, you will not do this, you will not do that, you will not do the other, and God damn it, if you try it, we will start killing you off again. <clears throat> We've done it before, several times, and we will do it again in the future if we have to. So the only way that your side of the argument in the United States is going to get its way is if they slaughter all of us or we're in a really generous mood and they beg nicely because they have, they have reached the limit beyond which my side is no longer willing to, um, to go, to, to cave in on for the sake of stability. Stability can be highly overrated. By the way, I will point out that it is not a sufficient condition that the people are armed uh, to ensure there won't be a tyranny. I, of course, refer you again to the fact of slavery and, of course, the internment of the Japanese in American concentration camps during the Second World War, while our brave soldiers were busy fighting in Europe and in the Pacific. Many Americans, many millions of Americans, sat here as cowards and let the Japanese Americans be corralled into cages and held there like animals. Not while I'm alive. That may have been America's best generation, as they call it, uh, but if it comes to it in my time, I'm going to see if I can't make sure that this generation is slightly better on that front. We will not have concentration camps in this country during my lifetime. I will have to be dead before I permit it. All right. Have a great day.